Today on Encore, the city-state that rose from the sands in just a few decades. The most populated metropolis in the United Arab Emirates with more than a million people and the most expensive city in the Middle East. It's a glittering monument to Arab enterprise and Western capitalism. Welcome to Dubai, the center of the modern-day gold rush. The view from the world's tallest tower, the Burj Khalifa, it's 163 stories high and can be seen from 100 kilometers away. But aside from all these glistening glories, the man-made islands and the underwater hotels, in this city built on dreams, is there a pulse that beats? Here in the Al Fahidi quarter, there's a glimpse of something else. While vast swathes of Dubai have been in the relentless drive towards the future, this neighborhood harks back to the quiet village that once was. I think we've done a great job marketing ourselves as a modern uh, cosmopolitan city, but uh, Dubai also has this beautiful district uh, uh, that's very well preserved and we always want to invite tourists to come and see it. So what's it like to live here? Um, it's like any other city in the world, I think. There's, uh, you know, there's the traffic, but there's a, there's a lot of great things happening in Dubai. With a quarter of a million Twitter followers and dozens of articles on news sites, Emirati columnist Sultan al Qasimi may well be one of the most resonating voices in the Arab world. His other mission is to further the art community in the UAE with his Barjil Art Foundation, which he created in 2010 from his personal collection of 600 works. This area is like his spiritual home. Yes, so uh, some of the houses have converted into studios. There's also a sort of a spring art exhibition here happening February and March every year. Um, and a lot of artists have taken up residencies in this area as well. So there's an art scene in Dubai that people might not know about. There's a vibrant art scene in Dubai. I think it's one of the most important art centers in, in the world today. In your incredible collection here, in your house um, of Arabic art, there are some artists from Dubai. What would you say is different about their work compared to other artists from other parts of the world? I think uh, the trick of a great artwork is that you can place where the artist is from. Uh, uh, however, you do see that there are elements that have to do with the Middle East and the Arab world and the Gulf, only because the region is so, the region is so charged with political events. So you can't ignore that. Where did this obsession, I think I'm going to call it, come from with art? Uh, Paris. Really? I, I blame Paris. So what happened? I, I lived there for four years and I came back to the Middle East and I discovered that we have a vibrant art scene or an art industry that I wanted to promote. And can Dubai really compete with places like Paris, London, mm -hmm. New York? Um, I think in, in some uh, senses Dubai has exceeded these, these cities. Um, if you want to buy Middle Eastern art, you don't buy it from Berlin or London or Paris or New York, you come to Dubai. So in a region of several hundred million people, this is the market for the art from the Middle East. A dominant Arab state and a modern Muslim country, the veil is not obligatory in Dubai, although women are expected to cover everything from shoulders to knees. That doesn't mean life as a female professional is completely free and easy, as Dubai's first female director discovered when starting out. But I didn't realize that it was going to be um, a subject or a topic that would really upset my parents. But I was very adamant. And then they're like, you can only travel if you're married. So then I had, I had a mission to find a husband within three months. So uh, met someone, lovely, lovely very simple, very chilled. After three, four times of seeing him, I said, look, I don't have much time. <laughs> I need to get hitched. I need to go, you know, get on a plane and study. And um, that was fun, creating a wedding so I can get a degree. It was just like the movies. It worked flawlessly. As well as marrying someone to further her career, Nyla hired an older male to sit in on her meetings early on, so people took her seriously. It paid off. Ten years ago, her film Unveiling Dubai premiered at the Dubai Film Festival, the first film ever made by an Emirati woman.
But being a pioneer doesn't mean turning her back on tradition. You're not obliged to wear the abaya here in Dubai. Why do you? It grounds me in a way. We are 12% of the total population. There's an imbalance in the demographic here uh, as a national versus expats. So, so sometimes I have to remind myself I'm actually in an Arabic country because there's so many expats. So what happens, us locals, like local women and men, uh, decide to wear the traditional so we kind of like stand out in a way. We can spot each other among the crowd, but it's also my business suit. You know, if I'm wearing this, I get respect from my people. I, I kind of like it. I'm, I'm speaking to you right now and I'm wearing pajamas and, and no one can tell. The lives of women and family life are often subjects that feature in Nyla's films. And she's not afraid to touch taboo topics such as child abuse in Arabana, the secret dating lives of Emirati women in wants. And Malal looked at arranged marriage. How do you decide your topics then as a female filmmaker in Dubai? I want the story to be kind of real to the, to the place I'm in. There are no many UAE national film directors. There's only like three or four of us. But there are tons of stories. Dubai itself is a phenomena. You know, where you have my grandmother who used to live in like mud huts, to us like in our Porsches and SUVs, like the country's 40 plus years old and it's like it took one big Botox and now we're here. It's just been so fast. So among that madness, you will find very interesting contrasts and stories to be told in this city. And in this city of many stories, there are three different communities all swirling around each other. There are the Emiratis. There are the expats who over the past 30 years have been invited in tax-free, coming in their millions, swamping the local population. Then there's the foreign underclass, predominantly from the Indian subcontinent, who built the city. Here in Ravi's, in the Satwar area, everyone mixes together. I was born in Lebanon, however, I, I moved to Dubai at age 10 when my parents decided to get work here. I'm from Bangladesh and uh, last eight years I'm here in Dubai. I think Dubai is a wonderful place in, in a sense that it allows people to interact with so many other nationalities. I like this country. I want to uh, uh, grow our, uh, my career here. If you have the qualification or you have the right way, then you can achieve your goal here. Award-winning filmmaker Mahmoud Kabour met Ashraf on his most recent film, Champ of the Camp, a documentary filmed in Dubai's controversial labor camps. It shows their X Factor meets Bollywood singing competition. It premiered at the 2013 Dubai International Film Festival. The singing competition, to me personally, offered an, uh, a smart or rather clever opportunity to enter the labor camps and see what they're like. And at the same time, to do so with a very entertaining angle, to bring in a reality TV kind of approach and put these men in the limelight for a little bit. And why did you choose not to focus on the depressing side of the camps that everyone else talks about? Well, I think it comes across naturally. I didn't need to pinpoint stuff, but it's always in the background. You see, you see the industrial kitchens, you see rooms with men stacked like sardines in their bunk beds. Meanwhile, in the foreground, you have these men who are vying to be the champ of all camps of that year and be crowned a, a, a champ for one moment. And why is it the singing competition so important, Ashraf? Uh, it's a platform, I think, uh, for us, uh, for, you know, uh, for showing our talent in uh, outside. And uh, in Champ of the Camp, I got a platform for uh, this. And after this film, I got more chances in outside for stage show. <laughs> This 
serious satwa is very different to the Dubai that we see elsewhere, isn't it? Satwa is pretty much what Dubai used to look like perhaps 30 or 40 years ago. And for that, it's very important. There's a strong point of contrast to the rest of the city, to the glitzy uh, skyscrapers and the hotels, which are a mere two or three kilometers away from here. And for that, it has become an important urban landscape for many artists like myself. We really are trying to make a statement and to let people know that Satwa should stay because, you know, it's not an eyesore, it's historically important and we would hate to see it gentrified. On Satwa, there's always something about to happen. On a corner, dodging traffic, jumping signals, then jumping friends, missing a cab, then with it reuniting. Generation, cohabitation, bus station and transformation. Dust into towers, sand into glass, bend and sweat and turn around. The best way to experience Dubai's distinct social strata is through your stomach. From Dubai's cheap eats to five-star cuisine of the highest order. The most recent celebrity chef import is the Bulgarian-British phenomenon, Sylvana Rowe, who's opening her third restaurant. And the reason I came here is because I saw a niche, I saw a gap, I saw a big hole in the market. I supply my restaurants with mostly organic and local food coming from local farms. Instead of the food being flown all the way, like 98% of restaurants in this country import. 98% of food comes from abroad. My food is 67% locally sourced, and the rest I bring in as well, because certain things you can't get here. Dubai alone has over 6,000 restaurants, and none of them are making it their, their agenda to supply local, you know? This is local baby shark, it's really delicious, and this is an Emirati dish which I'm preparing. This is called Emirati Gashit. And who's your clientele? Who eats here? Lots of uh, local Emirati population, as well as uh, a lot of expats. French love my places as well, completely. For me, that's a massive compliment because, you know, French all over the world, they have an amazing palate. And of course, Sheikh Mohammed is very fond of our cheesecake. The cheesecake has become Dubai's favorite. And so then you are a big star in the UK. What did you think of Dubai when you got here? Well, I didn't know what to expect, but for many years I avoided coming to Dubai quite consciously because Dubai always seemed to be very loud, very shiny, very kind of glossy and kitsch. But um, there's an amazing energy about this city. For me, everything in life, whether it's a friend, whether it's an event, it's about energy, it's about positive energy. And Dubai just has it. 